Uh, yeah, we're back again. Welcome to another episode of Simply Talking Podcast. I'm your host, Simply Talking, with my co-host, Miss Confidence in the building. <laughs> and tonight we got a special guest, life coach, Brenda Vitor. How you doing, Miss Vitor? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Most it's definitely, awesome. most definitely. Um, so we like to get right into it. So we're going to get right into these questions. Okay. Uh, I believe in ladies first, so Miss Confidence. Ms. We do agree on that. We we agree on that one. Um, so Brenda, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's an honor. It's such an honor. So, how do you navigate the balance between providing your support tailored to to your clients, each one of them, and your needs and maintaining a structured coach approach? coaching board approach. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, I guess everyone does have different needs, of course. However, I have a, I have a framework that I use in my own mind, uh, that I call the arc, which is, uh, awareness, radical, personal responsibility, choice, and change. And so when I meet someone and they talk to me, I can decipher where on my own personal framework they are so that I can meet them where they're at. And then um, I dive into there. I, I refresh, um, sort of remind them of how far they've come because I can see where they're at. And then I say, well, it seems to me like you're he already here. You've already overcome this. You've already dealt with that. So let's just dive in right where you're at. And that's kind of how I do it. That's my own framework that I created for myself after doing this for a long time. Because otherwise, uh, uh, you'd be starting everybody at the exact same spot, which is not the case everyone's at a different air spot so when you say at a different spot what you mean the, the way their uh mindset is yeah like sometimes people um like there's an awareness portion of um when people come to me for life coaching just depending on whatever their situation is majority of the people that come to me are stuck in what i call the loop of doom where they wake up every day and they repeat the same day over and over and over and they don't have they don't have a sense of belonging or a sense of purpose or they don't really have any identity of their self they're just doing everything for everybody else so i call that the loop of doom you just wake up and repeat yourself so yeah. however some people are already aware that their mind is in the way some people are already aware that um, they're living um, based on some trauma that they experience but other people don't even know that they say, I don't know why I'm like this. I don't know why I'm here. So if they're if they have the awareness, I know my mind is is always in the way. My mind is always talking me out of doing things. I'm always self-sabotaging. Well, they're already in the awareness stage in my mind. So I know that where to where to take them from there. Where other people that are just completely confused and lost, we just have to back up and be, and help them to become aware that their mind is not who they really are and um I kind of go through that whole thing about that you're not your mind, that your mind is a function of this body. It's not who you are, that you are spirit. You are not your mind. And I, I get them to yeah. take them through some exercises where they can actually witness their mind thinking, and then they can, they can identify that they're not their mind because they're witnessing it. So who's witnessing it? Yeah. You are. Does that typically take a long time for them to bring them to their awareness for themselves? No, not really. Um, it's sh quite shocking. When I started this practice um, eight years, over eight years ago now, I uh, used to work with people for a 10-week period. And um, my uh, the people who teach me and the marketers in my industry would tell me that I need to stretch it out over six months or a year. And I was thinking, well, I'm not doing that because people can get a transformation and 10 weeks why would I make them wait six months it's kind of crazy so um then but now we've been I, I I've kind of streamlined it to a point now where after I shrunk it down to even six weeks so when people come in um within six weeks they're already seeing a transformation happen so it's just I know how to explain everything in in great detail so that they can actually understand it gotcha gotcha yeah. gotcha so can you uh, elaborate on specific mindset shifts that you find universally impactful for individuals facing challenges and circumstances? Um, yeah, so this is where I was telling you that I'm, I coach a little differently than other people. So with me, um, I, I explain to people straight off the hop that 
um, your mom, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And because we, uh, it doesn't matter what anyone's faith is, God, spirit, universe, source, it doesn't matter that we all agree that we have a soul and a spirit that leaves this physical body once we pass from this earth. So because we can all agree on that, we can all agree that this body is the character of our life. We're born into this body. We grew up in that family. We experienced those traumas or not. We have all these experiences which created all of our perceptions, all of our thoughts, all of our memory, our mind. But within us, we also have a spirit. And so the, the character houses the spirit. So when it comes to your mind, your mind is part of your character. It's not part of your spirit. So when I when I get into detail about the character of the spirit, people can identify with because your spirit would be where your intuition is, where pure love is. That's that's who you really are, your authentic self. So we look at uh, and quite frankly, once we do the work around spirit and character, you have a whole new respect for character. His character is housing spirit. <laughs> So when people, for instance, uh, when somebody comes to me for like a mindset issue or say somebody comes to me for weight, I want to lose weight, you have a, you don't even have to worry about weight loss, dieting, exercise or anything like that because you automatically want to treat your body differently because you know that you're blessed to have this body to house your spirit, to house your authentic self. So that's kind of how I go about the whole mindset thing, the mindset is part of the character. It doesn't know any different. You're 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 in this body. Your heart beats. Your eyes blink. Your mind thinks. It's not who you are. It's a function of this character. Yeah. If that makes sense. <laughs> yes, it do. Oh, you're muted. You on mute? Sorry. <laughs> So um, in your in your practice, your coach practicing, uh, how do you address uh, intersexuality and identities and how do you experience them amongst the diverse range of your clients? Say that again. Sorry, I, I didn't I didn't understand the question. All right. I think I think I hear you. You have your fan on. I think I can hear it. It's, it's like my fan. Yeah, you have a fan. I can hear it. Oh, okay. the microphone. Yeah. Turn it off. Yeah, or down. Yeah. Okay, hang on a second. Sorry. Okay. No, it's not. okay. You got an uh, echo too. I do. I do. Yeah. I can't hear it. Is that better? Uh, yeah. It's the eye I turned it off. Okay. Okay. Um, in your coaching practice, how do you address intersexuality and identities and experiences among a diverse range of your clients? I'm not sure I understand that question. Like intersexual, what does that mean? No, in intersectional. <laughs> intersectional. I don't know what that means. How do you address the intersectional of identity? Like, you have to pull the dictionary out. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that yeah, means. Yeah, I don't know how to answer it. I, I'm a, I, that's what I was like. Well, we're gonna, well, we, well, we can just pass and we can go to the next question. Okay. That'll be, that'll be easy. So, how do you assist your clients in identifying and dismantling self limiting beliefs that may hinder their personal growth? Okay, so uh, self-limiting beliefs are um, a part of, obviously, uh, the experiences that you've had in the past. So we would go through, um, so basically what I do is I take people back in time to find uh, what I call the meat of the tomato. There's always one, one thing in their life, and often, most of the time, people don't even realize what it is. They think they know what it is, but once we dig deep, it surfaces. And there's one um, event that created the limiting beliefs. Uh, and so once we get there, depending on what it is, and, and if it's traumatic or if it's just a, a, an episode that caused them to not believe in themselves, then we do some form of modality to heal it, whether it be forgiveness work or 
there's, there's so many different things. And then once they've done that, um, what happens miraculously, which is part of the reason why I can get people through this transformation so quickly, is that when you find the thing that traumatized you or the thing that created the limiting belief and you heal it, um, everything that happened from then till now just collapses like dominoes. You don't have to go in and deal with everything that's happened, uh, you know, your whole life. It doesn't matter because it was all a result of this. So we go in and we really get into the meat of the tomato, I call it, and we dig deep and we go through that whole healing process of whatever it was. Some t- I've had, I, for instance, I'll give you an example. I had a, a lady over in the UK and um, she came from a wonderful family, loving parents, and she had one sister and her sister um, was dying and she was she she had all kinds of limiting beliefs. She didn't feel good enough. She was, you know, unlovable, but her parents loved her. Her sister loved her. She, had, she didn't grow up with any trauma. And so by the time we dug in and found it, what it was, was that when she was a child, her father had said to her and her sister, uh, she said to her, he said to her, you're the beauty and she's the brains. And so my client felt like she was stupid. She felt like she wasn't good enough, that she couldn't get ahead in life, that she wasn't as good as her sister just from that one comment that her father had said. But he didn't mean any harm by it, but it affected her. So once we found that, then we went in to uh, switch the perception. What was your? What did your father really mean? And we kind of dug into it that way. Change your perception. It's like the Wayne Dyer quote: "When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change." And so we have to find a way to flip that so that you can have a different perception about it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect. I do okay, so that I got fluttering. The- I don't know what that fluttering is. It's not yeah. I, yeah, I'm not for sure either. I can hear it, but. Yeah. Oh well. Um. So I looked up the word, and um, intersectionality is study of overlapping or intersecting social identities and related systems of oppression, domination, or discrimination. Hmm. I don't really know how to answer that question, quite frankly. <laughs> We can skip it. <laughs> yeah, because I don't really understand it, so I don't want to. I don't want to answer it incorrectly. Yeah, we can definitely <laughs> skip it. <laughs> okay, so um, how do you approach uh, discussions around forgiveness and letting go of the past? Uh, you got to go your- back. You have to go back one. Oh. Oh, sorry. How do you assist <laughs> clients in identifying and dismantling? No, you have to go. You have to go back one from number six. <laughs> go back one. You see number five. I don't have five on here. No. No. What strategy? You don't see what strategies have you? No. No. Okay. Well, no. what strategies <laughs> yeah, have you yeah. found effective in helping clients build it and maintaining a healthy relationship? Uh, a healthy relationship. Well, absolutely, hundred percent. You are your relationships on the outside are a direct reflection of the relationship you have for your, with yourself. So my whole work is around building the relationship that you have with yourself, that it's unconditionally loving yourself, unconditionally trusting yourself, becoming in alignment with who you really are, and walking in the shoes of your authentic self. The end. And once you do that, and I'm also an energy person, so once you do that, your energy is in complete alignment. And so therefore, you're going to draw to you like the like attracts like. So yeah, I, yeah, I, nev- yeah, I never one time ever focus on the other person or finding another person ever. I always say, let's work on you. And then once you are in energetic alignment with who you really are and your authentic self, you're going to draw to you everyone that belongs in your life and everyone who doesn't is going to fade away naturally without hostility, without chaos, without any of that stuff. Your relationship with yourself will draw to you a healthy relationship. The end. Gotcha. Now you said something earlier about time traveling or you? Time collapsing time. Oh, okay. Collapsing time. So you collapse time. Yeah, collapse time. So, so my work is around, um, becoming future you, so becoming the future version of yourself. So when when we do when we do the work, we get you, we get people into understanding really 
what they want in life, not what society deems acceptable, not what you were taught in school, not what your parents taught. I don't, I always say, I don't care if you want to pick daisies all day. It doesn't make any difference. What do you truly want at a soul level? And then when you walk in the shoes of that person, um, like some people will say, what do you, what do you want to achieve in three years? Well, you don't need to wait three years. You can wake up tomorrow and be that person. You could just turn your head and be that person in a minute from now. We don't have to wait for anything. What for? We just can collapse time and be the person now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like when people say, um, "I don't, uh, I, I don't, I want to quit drinking," for instance, "I want to quit drinking" or "I want to quit smoking." Well, then you're not a smoker. You're not a smoker in this moment. Why do you? Why do we have to wait? Why do we have to always put everything off? I think that was something that was taught to us that we always have to wait for things to happen. Well, we don't. You could choose to not be a drinker right now. You could choose to be a non-smoker right now. You could choose to be a healthy eater. What, what are we waiting for? We just That's collapse me. time. <laughs> That's me. The healthy eater. <laughs> yeah, he, try, he tries to teach me some things and tell me, That's bad. Why are you eating there? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone has to do it on their own time, right? Yeah, I yeah. guess, but... Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> back. Okay. So how do you approach discussions around forgiveness and letting go of the past during coaching sessions? Okay. So I have forgiveness work that I work with people whereby I take them. Um, first of all, we identify who needs to be forgiven personally in my uh, life over the past 29 years in personal development and self mastery. I had to go through forgiving 33 different people that traumatized me as a young person. So when I when I did this forgiveness work, I learned from a whole bunch of different people. And then I kind of just formed this way of doing it that worked for me. And that's what I share. My clients do it and they it works for them. So I take them through a forgiveness work where they do write a letter to the person that they're forgiving. And in that letter, they first of all identify like rawly what their behavior did. How did it hurt you? Um, and you just go into as much detail as you possibly can because nobody's reading the letter. So you can be completely honest and say everything that comes up for you. Once you do that, then you move into the compassion part of the portion of the letter where you say, I understand. I don't agree with what you did. I don't condone what you did. However, I understand that you had issues in your life that you haven't healed yet, blah, blah, blah. Depending on the person, you have to know who they are and that and what they went through and how what brought them to be that type of person because nobody just wakes up one day and decides to hurt another human something happened that they are healed from then from the from the uh, compassion portion of the letter we move into what did i learn because of what happened i learned to be a better mother to take care of my children to love them wholeheartedly and not and listen to their emotion, whatever your situation is, the forgiveness letters are specific to the person. And then once we're done the letter, when we burn the letter, we actually touch base with our younger self that experienced it. And together, the younger version of ourselves and our current self release it and set ourselves free and we cut the energetic tie to that situation. So there, that way, you're forgiving the person but you're setting yourself free. And I'll go back to the we're all connected thing. We're all connected. There's no separation. And so if we forgive the other person, we get, we literally release them for their own growth. We cannot, we have to let them grow. And we have to help other people, even if it's through energy. Uh, we don't just sit in the same room as somebody who hurt us and have coffee, of course, but mm-hmm. forgiving them releases our energetic tie and then allows our spirit to flow freely and the same goes for that person set them free they can go on their own journey at their own pace whatever we're not it's not our responsibility but it just cuts the energetic tie to that gotcha. yeah so what advice do you offer individuals who may be hesitant or resistant to seeking help from a life coach um so personally uh um Without, uh, I'm not, not to be modest, but I usually get on a call with people and everybody signs up. There's not really anyone who doesn't sign up. But, but I have had people that question it. And so what I say is, if you, you have to know that you want something to change. You wouldn't be on this call 
if there was nothing that you wanted to change. So you're here, you're on the call. It's okay, you're on the call. How bad do you want that to change? And if you want it, if you want the thing to change, then you have to show up for yourself. You have to be coachable and you have to be able to hold yourself accountable. And if you're not ready to do that, you're not ready to do that. That's fine. Come back when you are ready to do that. Yes. Right? Because that because that's sense. what it's about. Like we're not we're not friends. Like we're friendly and we're all love and light. And we're we're exchanging energy here. And I'm gonna guide you. I'm not doing anything for anybody. I'm just helping people, guiding them back to who they really are. Who you just forgot who you are. We're all full of light. It's just yeah. you, you the guidance, right? So yeah. if you're ready to accept that and you're ready to get on the path, why wouldn't you want to be? Why wouldn't you want to be done with what's holding you back? What's limiting you from living your best life? Why you must want it, or you wouldn't be on the call. Mm-hmm. So you're you're guiding them back into doing their own work, um, right? To, well, to getting into when you get into alignment with who you are authentically. This is the thing: we're not mm-hmm. authentic, and they say that love holds the greatest energy in the world. But lately, there was a new study done that that's called Spain S P A N E. And it's, it was a it was a study that was done, and what they found when they measured the energy with people is that love had a very high vibration, but what held a higher vibration was authenticity, four thousand times higher, which means we're not even living authentically. And if we think about it logically and realistically, without getting into any of the world events, every single human being on this planet was trained identically. Get up at 7, eat breakfast at 7.30, go to school at 8.30, have a break at 10, have lunch at noon, have break at 2, have dinner at 5, have a shower at 7, and go to bed. Every one of us, Saturday morning you do your chores, Sunday you go to church. It's We were all, and none of us really got to express who we really are. And if you were the person that did yeah. try to express who you really were, you were stop daydreaming, stop speaking your imagination. And we were kind of stifled. So now... What I help people to do is go back to that. Go back to who you really are. It's okay now in this world. It's okay to be who you really are. You, there's no one going to stop you. There's no judgment. And anyone who does judge, judge you, they're not at your table. They're at your old table. You're switching tables. You're going over here to this new table. There's different people there. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I, th- I think a lot of times uh, people don't like change. Unless it's going to like make people you feel don't like better. Change. But when you think about change, yeah. when you think about change, if you can get in your imagination, which is another thing I've learned in the manifestation, because I specialize in ma- self mastery and manifestation, but not manifestation in a woo woo sense. Manifestation in the sense of we're always manifesting. Whether you're happy or you're sad yes. or things are good or they're bad, we manifested it based on where our energy's at. So if you know that the the lack of money or the bad relationships are all because of you, they're all coming from you. That's why it's happening. Nothing's coming at us. I learned this from Michael Beckwith when I studied with him, is that life does not happen to us. Life happens through us. It always goes back to the same thing. It always goes back to your relationship with yourself. And if you were to be able to get into your imagination and see yourself living a life that it, and no one's judging you. So you can just get in there and do anything. You can drive that car. You can go on those trips. You can be with that partner. You can be this healthy, whatever it is you want. And you can just be in there and how happy you are. If you knew that there were some steps you could take to actually live that, that's nothing to fear. And let, if you don't mind, I'll say a little thing about fear. We were taught also to be afraid of fear, to be fearful when you're afraid. And I uh, do not believe that to be true. I believe that fear is your body pinching you to lean in. Unless you're being chased by somebody, your life is in danger, something like that. But if you're about to change, your mind's job is to stop you and keep you in the familiar. No, no, we're not going there. And so then you get the sense of being afraid. But if, if you actually were to yeah. be the observer <laughs> And you heard actually say, is there any, is that I'm going to get hurt? Am I hurting anyone else or am I getting hurt? No, I'm not. Then I'm leaning in. I'm leaning in because this is where I'm supposed to go. And that spirit guiding me. That's, that's how I approach that one. Yeah, I see. It's, it's on you. 
Name. Microphone off. Apologies. Look, I'm always uh um, I'm turning your microphone off, ma'am. <laughs> uh, <pretty. laughs> uh, how do you incorporate uh, mindfulness and present moment awareness into your coaching method methodology to enhance client outcomes? Mindfulness and what was the second part of that? Oh, sorry. And uh, present moment awareness. Right. So I am a firm believer in uh, mindfulness. I'm a firm believer in breath work. Breath work is a huge part of my day. Um, I say uh, 29 years ago when I started my journey, breath work is what saved my actual life, literally. Mm -hmm. And so I, every one of my clients is required to do breath work. And um, what I do from the very beginning before they get deep into it is I have them put five reminders in their phone with a little chiming bell that says breathe. And then I teach them to do the four, two, four breath work, which is just breathe in for four, hold for two, out for four. You don't have to sit still. You don't have to close your eyes. I've done it in taking minutes and meetings. I've done it out doing things. I've done it when I'm on with my clients. And it, what it does is it teaches your, your nervous system to calm down. And it also, you're taking deep breaths because you don't breathe. You always breathe up here. And so it trains you over the day. So if you do this five times a day, so I use breath work. Like, as a matter of fact, I won't work with someone who doesn't do breath, won't, won't attempt to do breath work, because it doesn't matter what you change. If you don't, we're working on the inside. And when we're having stress and, and uh, we're feeling unworthy and we have all these negative emotions going on, our nervous system is out of whack. So we need to calm it down and we need to bring it down. And if people, and I always make people do the 424 with me so that they can literally feel it. It takes 90 seconds to do three rounds of 424. So everybody has 90 seconds. You don't have to stop what you're doing. And everyone loves it, actually. Both male and female clients love doing it. They still do it. They message me all the time, even if I'm done working. Do you have any more? Where would you send me if I want to you know, keep going with the breath work? Because I love it so much. It calms my body down. So breath work is, it, it, and mindfulness to me, which I learned from John Kabat-Zinn, was um, being in the present moment and literally being in the present moment, which people do not do. And if you're walking down the street to actually look at the trees, actually look at the dog, actually look at the grass and the building and the things, instead of being in your mind, thinking about everything, literally look at what's right in front of you right now in this exact moment. And if you can breathe at the same time is really a game well, changer. Well, you basically just answered my question that I was about to ask. What was it? <laughs> but I'll ask it anyway. Okay. Can you can you share empowering daily rituals or practices that individuals can adopt for positive change in their lives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you <just> and so <laughs> yeah, so the breath work for sure, and the and the being being mindful, being in the here and now, of course. But another thing that that people can do is to really become the observer of your thoughts. And so the mind is a powerful thing and it's full of all of our life experiences and it's going to continue to keep us in the familiar no matter what. And it's very strong. But but if we can become the observer and learn to not react and take the pause where we actually go, oh, look, listen to what my mind's doing it happens to me all the time. I mean, the other thing is that you're never there. I've been on this journey for 29 years. And I mean, where I began is. Compl like you wouldn't even know I'm the same person, which I'm not the same person, but you know, you change so much, but, but there's always going to be triggers and there's always going to be life events. And there's always going to be things that jolt you. Nobody lives in bliss every second of every day stuff happens. But what I like to do is give people tools that they can stack. And then when you have something hit you, you can pull one of those things because you've already tried it. You know, that's going to calm me down if I'm having an anxiety attack or something's happening, somebody's triggering me. And so you mm -hmm. stack all your tools and then you use the breath work every day. I still use it every day. I meditate every day for an hour in the morning, an hour at night. I'm addicted to it. I love it because I love to be in that peaceful state connected to my authentic self. I mean, there's nothing more blissful than that. So it's almost like I get so excited to do it. It's not work. And we also were trained that the word work is a daunting, oh my God, kind of thing. So nobody wants to do when you say the word work. I wish I could come up with new words, to be honest. But if the work was going to bring you to, 
to to a place that's going to light you up every day, you do the work. That's mm -hmm. true. Right? Yep. <laughs> Yeah. I was going to say, can you like show us a uh, breathing technique? Because I do breathing techniques too. So just to calm yeah, me down, course. even with my asthma, I use yes. uh, breathing techniques, which yes. I haven't used an inhaler in years from it. Good for so, you because you're yeah. breathing deeply and you're, you're breathing into your lungs, right? So for the 424 breath work is, is honestly, you just, you breathe into the count of four, all the way into your belly. So your belly comes out. You hold it for two. You blow it out huh. for four. It's just that. And then once you're, but you do it three times in a row. You do a loop, the loop three times. In for four, hold for two, out for four. In for four, hold for two, out for four. And then we can change it up later and do the flag pull, which is eight, four, eight. Like there's different ones once people get used to it because four, two, four mm -hmm. is enough from the beginning. But breathing, um, is, is an instant relaxer because when we have anxiety, um, it's, a, it's a feeling that we want to get rid of. It's the feeling. And so what happens is that um, the feeling, we want the feeling to be gone. So we forget, we bury it or we react and get into something out there so that we don't have to focus on this. But if we actually felt the feeling of anxiety or or sadness or whatever the emotion is we don't want and we breathe into it and focus where is it where is the feeling it's usually here when you feel that feeling and you breathe and and as you're breathing you focus the breath on the spot and you don't let go of your focus keep your focus on the spot and you breathe it will literally just it'll vanish it'll go away and soon as someone experiences it and they go it actually went away i go exactly now you have mm -hmm. a tool. Now you have a tool. So whenever you feel like that, just pull the tool in. It doesn't have to be complicated. And, and when people are on a journey for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever their journey is, it's that long. And they have all the stuff that they're trying to unpack. And we've been taught to spend a year or two years or three years. Quite my personal experience is was when I was 30 is when I started this journey. And I saw a psychotherapist for six and a half years, three times a week. I work with her today. She's one of my closest friends. And she kept saying to me, you're intellectual. You get this. I don't understand. I go, it has nothing to do with my head. It's my mm -hmm. body. It's the emotions. It's the feeling. She didn't know. She didn't learn it in school. So she had no idea how to help me. And so when I went to the college and I studied psychology first, because I said, I want my doctorate in psychology because I want to understand what the mind, not because I want to be a doctor, because I don't, but I want to get it. I want to actually get what the mind's doing. And then I'm going to understand the mind-body connection, emotions. Where do they come from? How do we stop this feeling? Because everyone who's going through something wants a different feeling. Hmm. Even when you want you when you want to attain something, it's not because you want the thing. It's because you want the feeling that the thing gives you. Mm. So everything is about emotions and feelings. So that's when I just and that is what had control of me. I had no emotional regulation. So my emotions were taken over me back in my early days because of all the trauma. I understand why. But they had a hold of me and I didn't mm. I wanted out. So in order to get out, I had to learn it and understand it. And a lot of, and most of the time, probably 100% of the time, we bury all of our emotions and they get tightened up, which is what I call a subscar. And it's a little uh, ball of energy. And then something triggers us and we don't want it out. So we find a way to ignore it, stuff it down, stuff it down, stuff it down, stuff it down. Then we become an adult and these things happen. And what's happening, a trigger, what's happening is that the trigger is telling you that this, tr this energy that's been stuffed in there since the beginning wants out. It wants out. So in order for it to get out and flow, because energy is, it, it, it's, um, sorry, emotions are energy in motion. And so you need to get it moving. And mm -hmm. if it's stuck, you're going to be triggered forever. Mm -hmm. And it's quite shocking how quickly people can actually get in there and release that. Because why don't you want to? Isn't that why we're here doing this work is because you are having yep. this consistent <laughs> trigger. So let's do the thing. You can experience it working, and now you have a tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I tell folks you got to connect with your feelings and emotions because if we, a lot of us disconnect from, that's right. From the, and, we and, and with all, yeah, and it's it's understandable because a lot of us 
suffered some great traumas. A lot of us weren't allowed to speak about our emotions and how we felt. It was kids that were to be seen and not heard. The parents were always right, you know, or if we even had parents, who knows, right, what was going on. And so we didn't ever really get to, we had to grow up too quickly. I mean, honestly, the, the way the world is going, we're all going to be okay because there's more and more people helping people to understand that, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I think that... Um, I think that when people understand what emotions are and that we're doing everything we're doing for a feeling. So how do we then learn to regulate our feelings and our emotions? Agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. So how do you foster a sense of accountability and motivation in your clients as they work towards their personal goals, their personal goals of development? So I have um, a framework that I stick to. Um, when people sign up with me, I do not do one-off coaching calls. I do six weeks at a time minimum. And I have a zero money back guarantee. And if you don't show up and do your homework, you lose the money because we have to redo it because you didn't do it. Oh, smart. <laughs> because for me, my coaching isn't about taking your money. And you having someone that you can talk to every week. That's not what I do. I have a framework that I want you to have a transformation. Truthfully, because I spent so many years trying to get my own transformation. And I've spent 29 years in this whole world of doing this. So I, I want to be able to help you to find peace within yourself. Right? Most definitely. So... What role does self-compassion play in the healing journey? Well, self-compassion is probably the most important thing, which goes along with self-love, which is what most of us lack. And, <laughs> uh, you know, so self-compassion, once you learn to, first of all, once you identify who you really are and what you really want, and you lose uh, the care about what other people think and what society deems acceptable, then you become in love with being by yourself. And when you can love being by yourself at, and you feel yourself going through something, you have to understand it like you would understand someone else. You have to have compassion for yourself the way you would have compassion for somebody else. And that's where the whole self-integrity thing comes in. You have integrity for other people. If somebody else is suffering and you're going to be there and you're going to be so compassionate, it's okay, is there anything I can do? Do you need anything? You know, I want to be supportive. But when it comes to you, it's like, oh, I'll just shove that back down and I'm good. Oh, I'm good. I got this. I'm strong. I can handle it. I'm good. And you know, you're not, you're not good. You mm -hmm. need to have love and care for yourself, just like you would the other person. So self-compassion, self-love are like locked. They're cousins for sure. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Now with the, um, with the, with the self-love and being by yourself, um, ain't that kind of scary because I'm gonna say for myself when I've been went through my journey and being by myself, like I don't know when it's when it's gonna come to an end because I like being by myself. Like I don't like to be. You know, mm -hmm. That's okay I like though. The, I like me time. Yeah. You know? Me too. <laughs> I mean, why does it? So here's the thing. I call this changing tables. So we're at this table with a whole bunch of people that some of them are are gonna come to our next table, but. For the majority, we've outgrown the people at the table. No judgment. Everybody's growing at their own pace. Everybody's, you know, your energies are just not aligned right now. That's it. So these people are at the table. Now you're at a table by yourself. And until you find the people that are going to be at your new table, you're going to sit at a table by yourself. And if you enjoy being at a table by yourself, the people that are supposed to be at your next table are going to appear. And for you, we'll use what you just said. I love you. I love you by myself. My kids go, Mom, you're so lonely. You're always alone. I go, I love being alone. And they go, no, it's not right. And I go, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's right. I, it's right. Because we're not alone. Because look where we are right now. We're mm -hmm. in a room with three people and whoever's watching. We're not alone. We're with people at our table. Mm-hmm. I got yeah. you. <laughs> because I used to. Right? So we're yeah. not alone. Yeah. Because I used to, I think that was one of my biggest vulnerabilities was I wanted to be loved so bad. And as you say, from my childhood traumas, but I identify that now, but 
I tried to, people will actually like being around me, but I think I had a lot of insecurity. So I was trying to actually fit in and buy love. And yeah. now that I'm on this new journey, it's like, I like my me time. I like mm -hmm. being by myself. Mm -hmm. I like and anybody who shows up at your table. Like, I mean, look mm -hmm. at the three of us. What are the chances we've met? Mm -hmm. we, <laughs> yes. we met because energies align. Mm -hmm. The reason mm -hmm. we're in this room. There's no other reason. There's no coincidences. Mm -hmm. I would not have seen your uh, a post. Your this opportunity. I would not have. You would not have accepted me had we not been on the same energy frequency. It wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. So when we yep. say we're alone, it's it's that we are disconnected from all that we knew, all of the way that we were, our old version of ourselves. No judgment. I learned mm -hmm. my lessons. Lots of stuff went on. I had lots of good times, met lots of great people. It was amazing at times. But now I'm over here at this table. So these are my new people. Some mm -hmm. of those people came to the table with me. Most of them didn't. Exactly. No hostility, no chaos, no dysfunction, nothing. It's just, I'm at a different table. It is what it is. We outgrow right. people. Yeah. We outgrow yeah. people. Right. And that's what I was saying. Like, simply, even simply, and I, he interviewed me. Oh. And and look, now I'm his co-host. So the, the energy <laughs> definitely, yeah. Absolutely, the energy mm -hmm. aligns. And we, we know that because if we walk into a room and someone is miserable, we just want to stay away from them. If somebody mm -hmm. is open and their energy is inviting, we want to be around them. Who's that? Who's that mm -hmm. person? And we want to be around them. And as we know, our energy field is surrounds our body. It's not in us. It's uh, we are energy and mm -hmm. it is, surrounds our body. So when we walk, if I walk into a room and I walk into a room and the energies of you and me and everybody, we're all joined together. So mm -hmm. I would prefer to walk into a room full of positive energy mm -hmm. and feed the room that. And if you're over there and you're miserable and your energy is so negative, I'm just going to stay on this side of the room. Or you just stay on that side. <laughs> or whoever they are, just stay on that side of the yeah. room. Don't come over right, here. Right. <laughs> Unless you want to release some of that and come and sit over here at this table with us. Yeah. Because right? when you're around a group of positive people, Something about us, mm -hmm. we overpower negativity. Oh, yeah. Like we suppress it. Like you yeah. can't do that over yeah. here. <laughs> and you know what? In a way, the, the way that I look at that is because back in the early, my earlier life, um, I did not know, truthfully, when I was young, I had so much trauma going on that I did not know what the difference between a pessimist and an optimist was. I didn't even know. I remember looking it up. What's the difference? Because everyone's going, you're such a pessimist. You're such a pessimist. I'm like, what's a pessimist? And I remember looking it up and figuring, oh my God, I am. I look for the negative in every single thing that's going on. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see the positive because I had so many traumas. I know a lot of people like that. Yeah. I used to be like that. I think <laughs> right. I like that. But if you think about it from a different perspective, and this is where compassion comes in for other people. And now you look at those people and I have this whole love and light thing that I do with people and I have breathe on one hand and I have Om on the other hand and I breathe in, not like this, but through my mind's eye, I breathe in my left arm, through my heart and out my right hand. And when I breathe out, this goes to people and it's always love, always. So whenever mm -hmm. I'm in the energy of someone who is negative, I breathe in through and I visualize this beautiful love coming through my heart and out my hand into that person's bubble because that's what they need. People mm -hmm. do not want to be upset and angry and miserable and insecure and jealous. They don't want to. It's not a good feeling. So nobody yes. wants to be there. So they need our love. Whether it doesn't mean that we let them sit at our table necessarily, but yes. we do have to send them love, right? Yep, mm -hmm. that's true. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I I think you're hitting questions too because now I'm looking at my next question. I think uh, Brenda just answered it. So <laughs> okay. Oh, I was I was next. <laughs> but here we go. Um, what role does goal setting play in your coaching process? So goals for me are. Um, I don't really work on goals. I work more on the becoming future you 
um, modality where we identify the future version of yourself. And then I have people uh, wake, identify, if you, if you identify the future version of yourself, and then you, um, sorry, my dog's barking. If you identify the future, future version of yourself, then you wake up every day and you walk in the shoes of that version of yourself. So if you're, if you have a version of yourself that is fit and healthy and eating well, and, um, you know, always positive and everything, and you wake up in the morning and you lay on the couch and you eat a chocolate bar and well, you're not living in the shoes of your future self. What would that person be doing? They'd be waking up early, going for a walk outside, sun gazing in the sun, grounding on the earth, the, the things that that person would be doing, your future version of yourself. So for goals for me, I'm not really a goal person. I'm more of a collapsed time person. Identify mm -hmm. who you want to be and be that person. Mm -hmm. and, gotcha. And, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So um, in your coaching practice, how do you address, address the importance of self-care and well-being as components of the process? Well, I think that all kind of ties in with the whole self-love um, and self-compassion and self-integrity. It all goes together. You have to treat yourself like you uh, want to be treated by what you, what you are longing for. You have to treat yourself that way. And you have to take care of yourself because there is no, never a time that somebody took care of themselves that they felt like shit. Pardon my language. If you take care of yourself, you feel good, right? And you, you, you know, you go exercise, you work out, or you go for a walk, or you eat something really yummy, and you feel so good, and you're full of energy, or you go on a talk, you're talking to people that are positive and uplifting. Well, that's all self care, all of it. It's not just about having a bath and getting your nails done. It's about where, who are you surrounding yourself with? What kind of shows are you watching? Stay away from the negative news. Stay away from all the negative talk. Keep your 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 language in a positive state because words have vibrations. Use the I am. I am is so powerful and not just I am beautiful. I am confident. It's like, no, I am confident. Like I am. I mm -hmm. am beautiful. I am wonderful. And you, so that's all self-care. It's not just about, I mean, I'm, I'm a bath person. So yeah, go have a bubble bath if you want, but that's not really all it's about. It's about the whole, how you treat yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you measure success in coaching practices, both for yourself and your clients? So, um, well, with the, with my clients, I measure, uh, their success by when we when we begin, I always ask them what do they hope to gain from the working with me. Nine out of ten times, it's inner peace. Inner peace is usually what people want. I want to have inner peace. So, by the when we're at the end of every session, I always ask, "What is your biggest takeaway from this call?" And they tell me what they gained. Now we're stacking. Gotcha. The next call. Now we're stacking. Now we're stacking. So then. I have it's all the sound and it's confidence. That's your phone. Check your phone. That's not my phone is on D and D. I heard something. You didn't see a, ain't a message on your phone. My phone is on do not disturb. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you messaging her? <laughs> I did I did send her a message, but I guess oh was yeah, I'm, I'm on D and D. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let me see. This next question. Yeah. So, um, what impact? Um, what impact or gratitude practices have have on fostering a positive mindset and overcoming adversity, according to your coaching philosophy? So, gratitude is um, probably biggest missing link in reality because we don't realize that uh we're we're blessed to be having this experience to begin with and so when we wake and i and i learned this gratitude practice from dr wayne dyer years ago where he would wake up in the morning and before he put his feet on the floor he would say thank you thank you thank you and then smile to release happy hormones 
And I do that every single morning. And I do recommend that my clients do that because you're just thankful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for another day. Thank you for another day on this earth. Because we forget that there's a lot of places in the world don't even have water or electricity. And we, we take all of these things for granted because we're always looking for more stuff, right? Outside yeah. um, gratification. And if we actually just looked around for every, all the things where so they say there's always something to be grateful for, there actually is. We're alive. We can see. We can hear. We can walk. We can talk. We're sitting at tables with people that are all genuine and, and authentic. So we have tons of things to be grateful for. So gratitude is something that you have to sometimes help people see because if they're lost in their trauma or they're lost in their stuckness in the loop of doom, if they're in the loop of doom, they can't see anything that's that's friendly. So you have to help them find the friendly things and then they just flow out. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well. Coming down to the end, we're winding down to the end. So at the end, I got my little special questions. Uh, ask them as fast as you can. Okay. And, um, Ooh, should yeah. I be scared? Am I getting judged? Am I getting graded? <laughs> no. No, no, no. Don't no, no. get points? No, no, no. no. Just, just a little, <laughs> little fun. A little fun questions. <laughs> right. He should add that in. What What is Brenda going to win? Yeah, what do I win? <laughs> uh, Yay, she <laughs> okay, go. Hit me. No. All right. Childhood celebrity crush. Childhood celebrity crush. Oh, I guess it, I'm old. So it would have been Donnie Osmond. Oh, wow. I remember the Osmonds. <laughs> yep. Who would you trade places with for a day? Who would I trade places with for a day? Uh, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. really? Oh yeah, I'd love you to trade that. places with you. Would trade places with somebody. Absolutely. I'd like to stand wow. straight up there and be him for a day, or beside gotcha. him if he'd let me. But if I had to <laughs> trade, I'd be with. I definitely trade places. Got you. Uh, guilty pleasures. Guilty pleasures. Hmm. hmm. I don't know if I have any guilty pleasures. Okay. I don't know if I do have any guilty pleasures. <laughs> <laughs> I have pleasures, but I'm not guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like them. <laughs> all right, all right. Biggest risk you ever took? Trusting myself. Trusting myself to walk out of that life, away from that table, and when I didn't know where this table was. Biggest risk I ever took. Best compliment you ever got. You are luminous. I'll never forget it because I didn't know what it meant. And it meant what when do, you walk what into do it the mean? Room, when you walk into the room, the light it the room lights up. But I didn't know what it meant when the person said it to me. You are luminous. I was like, thanks. I think. And then I had to go look it up because <laughs> I didn't know gotcha. what it meant. So that's what it meant. Yeah. Gotcha. What never fails to make you laugh? Children. Hmm. Children for sure. Worst piece of advice you ever got? Remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Worst piece of advice? That was the worst. <laughs> because when people say, when you're growing on your journey, and the people that aren't growing on their journey don't like mm -hmm. seeing you where you're going. And they say, you just remember where you came from. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to keep going. Gotcha, gotcha, right, gotcha. Right. Okay. Something you wish you was better at? Uh, uh, yoga. <laughs> 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 yoga for sure. Who would you like to be stranded on a desert island with? Ooh. God, but I guess I am because God is within me. So I'm okay. I'll be okay with God. That's the, uh, if you can't be by yourself, how can you be with somebody else? That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's so true, right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me something we don't know about you. Um, I love Harley Davidson, so I'm a motorcycle girl. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. That's cool. my biggest passion in life is motorcycles. I love it. The most I can see thing. it. I, I, I love that. it. 
I love being on the back of a motorcycle because it's just the most freeing thing. There's no phones, there's no interruptions, there's nothing. You're just, and you're one with earth and you see all the, everything. I see the birds and the water and it's just, I love it so much. I love it. It's a good connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that was it. That was my 10 little special questions I do at the end and, you know, try to get an idea. How did I do? Did I win the prize? Yeah, I told you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that was great. Thank you um, so much. (laughs) Oh, no problem. No problem. Definitely. We was happy to have you here and great conversation. Yeah. Great conversation. Yeah, it was great to meet you both. appreciate it. And I learned some, uh, like, that breathing technique. I'm going to try that. Yeah, you try that. I'm going to definitely try it. Do it. What a reminder. Breathing is one of the best techniques you can ever do, especially when you're upset and you get mad. A hundred percent. It that deep breath. Yes. You take that before the anger. It's like that's right. And you release it. And the other thing about doing the five reminders in your phone, because you forget to breathe. We all do. Sometimes I'll be sitting here working and then all of a sudden I'll go, it's like, oh gosh, I forgot to breathe. Like because you just get into things and you forget to breathe. But when you do it five times, you train your system to breathe deeply most of the time. Instead of only when you need it. If you only go to it when you need it, what if everything's going great for a long time, you're not breathing properly. So if you train yourself to breathe deeply all the time, then that just becomes the way you breathe, which is way healthier than not breathing, obviously. Shallow breathing Mm -hmm. is not good for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there any uh thing you want to uh send out like your um emails or your um web pages or anything you want to Yeah, you so know? um I have a group called Becoming Future You on Facebook. Okay. Uh so anybody's welcome to join there. Um and uh my website is brendavoltour.com and I do offer free um 30 minute sessions for people if they're struggling and they just want to talk it out for there's no obligation. I talk I I Put them in my schedule. Some people just some people come to work with me. Some people don't. There's no obligation to that. I just offer it because sometimes people are struggling and they need someone to lean on for a half an hour, and I just make myself available for that. So that's in my calendar on my website, so they can just go in there and book a free call if, if anybody's interested in that. Otherwise, join the group because I always have stuff going on. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And, and my um my co-host she uh she rarely does this. I don't know why she don't ever do it, but um. What day is your podcast, uh, Miss Confidence? <laughs> um, Mondays at 8 p.m. ET. And we talk Ooh. about helping others through life experiences. What's the name of your podcast, Miss Confidence? It is Unfiltered, Unspoken Podcast. All right. You can find Any us last on YouTube. Words? Okay. Um, come support. If you're going through, a, uh, if you're trying to heal, and going through that journey, um, come see some of the positive interviews that we have. You may connect with someone that can give you some positive advice just by watching their testimony so that you can start the journey uh, to healing. So we're on YouTube, uh, Unfiltered Unspoken Podcast. And if you have Roku, Unfiltered Unspoken Podcast under Tap TV. There you go. We got a network, little mama. We got a network. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. Well, simply all is definitely y'all. doing his thing. So I want to give a shout out to him. He's doing some amazing things, and uh, he has a quite a he has a couple, a few channels, and you know, <laughs> check him out. Celebrity, what is it? Celebrity, celebrity um, power. Celebrity power. Celebrity somebody power. talking. Yeah, and, then and I he has some. Um, um, a, a kids channel coming out soon. Yeah, I was gonna a say he has some exciting. Channel. Yeah, so. so check them out. Make sure you talk. Check simply talking out. Thank you. Like, share, and subscribe, and we out of here. You try to play, but you're never gonna be me. Look the other way. What I'm doing ain't easy. Bloody hands stain from the people who deceive me. Bloody hands break through the chains. Go free me. Look for change, looking for pain, pulling a mob, pushing a train. I'll never stop, stick to a lane, pick up the pieces and go rearrange. Uh, I'll be the 